Welcome to video number nine in the microfluidics course. So in this video, I'm going to be discussing the paper that I assigned for you to read at the end of video number seven and again at the end of video number eight. So I strongly recommend you read that paper on your own first before watching this and it's a fantastic paper. So it's called Making It Stick, Convection Reaction and Diffusion in Surface-Based Biosensors. And that was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2008. And so you can think of this video as like a sort of like one-sided discussion, similar to what I would do when doing live lectures for the microfluidics course, where I would have students come in and they'd read the paper and we'd have a discussion about it. So I'm just gonna be giving like my brief overview of this paper. And we'll consider this as sort of like wrapping up the transport portion of this course before we move on to something new in the next video. And so let's get started here. Okay, so basically what they're talking about in this paper is in our microfluidic systems, we oftentimes have sensors because we're trying to detect these target molecules, figure out how much of this target molecule we have in our sample. And so they're describing the transport of these target molecules to the sensors, which is important because we wanna design our microfluidic systems effectively. And in some cases we have only very few few of these target molecules in the given sample. And so we wanna make sure our system is capable of detecting that those are present. And so they describe this system as being fairly complex and there's lots of different effects at play here, right? So you have the target molecules that will diffuse randomly. We've talked about that earlier in this course. They can be convected along with the flow. We've also looked at that. And then there's the chemically binding. So they can bind to the surface, but they can also unbind and re-enter the solution. And when you think about all these different effects, they say in this paper, you have at least eight dimensional parameters that are required to describe this system. And that's very complex mathematically. So exact solutions aren't available unless you have very, very simplified systems. And it's hard to numerically model these and have those results be broadly applicable to a lot of different types of sensors. They tend to be fairly specific. And so this, what this paper focuses on is like understanding like which of these things plays a dominant role and providing a, a physically intuitive description of these processes. So we can take this extremely complicated mathematical problem, but then have an intuitive sense of what's going on. So as designers, we can make devices that are optimized to have our sensors detect these target molecules. So you'll see they develop these rules of thumb that are actually really neat. So you can determine like which of these processes is at play in a given system. So are they reaction limited or diffusion limited? It's actually really fascinating how they do that in this paper. So again, strongly recommend you read it. And now as we've been mentioning throughout the course, of course, they're going to do this with dimensionless parameters because the ratios of the different effects are really really informative and that's what we're gonna use to describe exactly how these systems are behaving. So again, right, we see this dimensional analysis is really what gives us the power to describe and understand these systems. Okay, so the figure I'm showing here is the model system that they're gonna talk about. Similar to the microfluidic channels we've looked at throughout this course, we have the height of the channel here, much smaller than the width of our channel. So we can do our classic 2D simplification where we don't worry about changes across the width direction because it's so much larger. They're showing this sensor here in green. So we have L is the length of this sensor and WS is the width of the sensor. There's these chemical binding constants, K on and K off shown here. And we have flow, right? So Q is our volumetric flow along the channel. Okay, so they're gonna simplify this and develop some models and give us an intuitive description of what's going on here. Okay, so they first look at a scenario where we have only diffusion. And this is a plot of their results shown here. So we have this parameter lambda, which is just a scaling factor, the length over the height the length of the sensor, right, over the height of the channel. And they're plotting a dimensionless flux here where that capital JD is the total collection rate in units of molecules per time. And so these color gradients are showing us a depletion zone of our target molecules because they've been depleted by our sensor. And so we see our flux decreases with time right, as this depletion zone grows. It takes longer for those target molecules to diffuse over to the sensor. So these inset plots, these color gradients here, show a case where lambda is equal to one. So the length of the sensor and the height of the channel are the same. So they're showing basically planar depletion right here in inset one. In two now, this is appealing to intuition. So they describe this as like the depletion zone now feels the channel height, right? Because it's reached that channel height and they're showing how the time scales, right? So there's the time for inset one. There's how the time scales for inset two. And then for inset three, right? That's how the time is gonna scale. For collection here, we're seeing inset three up here where the depletion zone now extends far into the channel and is basically uniform across the channel. And now at these longer time scales, they're saying our, our flux is independent of the sensor size once it's reached down the channel that far. 
Okay, so here's an example of how we have some fairly straightforward scaling that we can then use to determine what type of behavior we would expect for our sensor, right? And therefore design accordingly. And that's, of course, this case would be just driven by diffusion. Okay, so now they look at when we have convection as well as diffusion. And we've described these problems as well. So we know we're gonna use the Peclé number. So they've defined two Peclé numbers. So the first one is the one we're familiar with, this PE subscript H, which they refer to as the channel Peclé number. And we also have this PE subscript S, which they refer to as the sensor Peclé number. And so the channel one we remember, they've listed it as being a diffusive time over a convective time. And, and we've actually defined it as the advection effects over the diffusion effects, right? Basically the same idea. So if the Peclé number is high, right? Advection effects dominate, so that tends to be the flow is dominating, right? And if Peclé numbers are really low, we get into situations where the diffusion effects are dominating, right? So if the channel Peclé number is small then, we'll have our depletion zone extending far upstream, but if our Peclé number is really large, we'll tend to have a depletion zone that's thinner than the channel, right? So what's incredible about this figure is again, they've taken this very complex mathematical problem and broken it down with their scaling analysis and their modeling results here to show show us different regimes, different types of behavior we can expect if our sensor or our microfluidic system falls within a certain range. Okay, so we can start by looking at A here, which is like a phase diagram they've drawn. And so based on calculating, again, we've got sensor length here, right on the y-axis, our channel Peclé is what's plotted down here right, on our x. So in a given system that we have, we can calculate these two numbers and then see which zone we fall into, right? So for example, right, so they're saying we have this full collection region at low enough Peclé numbers, right, and large enough sensor lambdas, you're in region one here, right? And we can see that what that looks like at steady state based on these plots of the depletion zones again. So we can take, for example, point C right here. And that's this one right here, right? Where the sensor's here. And we see, again, we have this, right, this fairly diffusion dominant problem where the depletion zone extends upstream because the flow is going to the right, right? We can look at F as well. F's in this zone. Peckley number's a little higher, right? So if we just look at F right here, we can see that the flow is starting to push the depletion zone downstream a little bit. It's at a Peclé number of five, right? And then we can look at D, which is just right on the edge of our region one there, right? So we're just starting to get these different effects. So that's a Peclé number of one right here in D. So again, it's diffusive because it's fairly uniform across the channel, but we do have some flow right here around the sensor. A Little bit of convection or advection effects. And just quickly, I know I tend to be using convection and advection interchangeably here, but just highlight the difference here. So advection is referring to the movement of something, some material that's dissolved or suspended in the fluid, where convection refers to like the movement of the fluid itself. Okay, so in this case, we assume the convection, the movement of the fluid is moving, right? These target molecules within our fluid. So that's why I'm using them interchangeably, but there is a subtle difference between the two there. Okay, now we look at region two here. And in region two, so when we're talking about the depletion zone, the size of the depletion zone is defined by this delta S. And so our thickness of our depletion zone can be represented by this equation here relative to the length of the sensor. And so that essentially is what our sensor Peclé number is telling us. So we can think of this sensor Peclé number as telling us whether the depletion zone is thick or thin relative to the sensor itself. So if the sensor Peclé number is really large, then we'll have a depletion zone that's very thin compared to the size of our sensor. Whereas if our sensor Peclé number is very small, the thickness of the depletion zone will be large compared to the size of our sensor. So in this zone two then, we have these depletion zones that are thin compared to both the sensor length and the channel height. Okay, so what does that mean? So we can look at these, again, we'll take E here first, right? E is in zone two. And so we can see here, right? Our depletion zone is thin compared to the sensor, but also thin compared to the height of the channel. G is another example, right? So again, G right here, where the sensor length is very long, and so the depletion zone is very thin compared to both the sensor and the channel height. And then finally, I is our final example of zone two, so that's down here, 
right? And again, we see depletion zone, we can just barely see it there, right? So again, small compared to sensor length and channel height. And our, our final region is region three here, where we have this depletion zone, right? That's thinner than the channel, okay? But thicker than the sensor, right? So H is in our zone three here. So we look at this funnel case here. And so in this case, our channel Peclet number is 10, right? So depletion zone is small relative to the total channel height, right? But our sensor Peclet number, our PES, is small enough that the depletion zone is thicker compared to the sensor length, right? Okay, so again, right, incredibly useful analysis because they've taken this mathematically complex system and broken it down into all these different regions. So like if you had your microfluidic system, you can calculate these dimensionless parameters and then see like what kind of behavior you would expect for your system and be able to design accordingly, right? Very, very, very cool stuff. Okay, now the final thing I wanna talk about it from this paper is these examples of a micro scale sensor and a nanowire sensor that they show. You'll notice I haven't focused on the chemical reaction of the target molecule with the sensor. And honestly, that's just because I'm a mechanical engineer. So when I teach microfluidics, we're focused more on the physics of the flows. But if you're interested in the chemistry, please do read that section of the paper because it's also quite fascinating. So we see in this plot here, we've got micro scale sensor on the left and they're showing a nanowire sensor on the right. And they're showing again the steady state depletion zones in like this color gradient. Both of these have a very high channel Peclet number. So the depletion zone is thin compared to the channel itself, right? But the sensor Peclet is small in the nanowire sensor. So we see the depletion zone is actually fairly thick here compared to the size of our sensor here. Whereas the sensor Pecle is much larger for the microscale sensor. So we're seeing, right, we can look at this inset like compared to the length of that sensor there, right? The depletion zone is actually quite thin. So that's another example, right, of how you can use this analysis to analyze sensors in your own microfluidic systems. Very cool stuff. They talk about the chemical reactions in this example too. I'm not gonna go into that, because again, we're more focused on the flow physics, but it's cool. So if you're interested, definitely have a look at that. So in summary, right, I think we have a very impressive analysis, right? An incredible simplification of a complex problem. So it's easy for us to digest as engineers and design good systems. So basically they showed we have these two speed limits, they call them for our target collection. So we have our, our mass transport limit, right? Where the convection and the diffusion deliver the target molecules so slowly to the sensor, right? That the time for the reaction itself is negligible. And that's what I focused on in this video. And then you have another speed limit where it's the reaction itself that provides the limit when the mass transport of the target molecules getting to the sensor is much faster than the time for the reaction. And so we're seeing again what we've seen throughout this course, the power of using these dimensionless ratios to show us the relative importance of these different competing effects, right? So by looking at systems where we've had these large or small values of these dimensionless parameters, we can develop a, an intuition for the qualitative behavior and then use scaling relations for a quantitative understanding. Because we can take our system and then these dimensionless parameters are pretty simple to compute. So again, we see where our system falls within this different types of behavior. And then once we know how our system behaves, generally we know which approximations are appropriate. So they say in the paper here, this approach is not gonna help you know whether it's gonna take 20 seconds or 40 seconds for sensor equilibration, but it's gonna confidently tell you whether you can expect it to be in 20 seconds or 20 minutes, right? And this can help to design new sensors as well, okay? And seeing how your system behaves, you can understand whether it makes sense to have, for example, a larger channel or a larger sensor. And that of course is very helpful. Okay, so that's all for video number nine. Hope you read the paper, had your own thoughts on it. This is just a brief summary of what I was really impressed with in this paper and how powerful I think it is. So in the next video, we're gonna move on to capillary effects, which is something that is also very powerful and I find to be very interesting and impressive. So thanks for watching.